Good morning. Um, let me ask straight away for Pascal Lamy and Yves Leterme to, to come and join us. Is this on? Can you hear me? Wonderful. So first of all, let me immediately introduce you to Pascal Lamy, to Yves Leterme. I'll tell you who they are in a minute. Uh, I better tell you who I am. Um, my name's Frank Vogel. Uh, I've been carrying Peter Eichen's bags for over 20 years. <laughs> and I've been sitting at the knee of the wise people, the young, the old, the people from distant countries, the people from here in Berlin, to learn a bit about the fight against corruption. Um, as James Baldwin once said, once we walked in darkness, now we can see the light. And that's thanks to so many wonderful people. And you know, the wonderful people we've praised this morning, um, who I've learned from, uh, they in turn got helped a little bit by people who I just want to mention very briefly, and I, don't, I want you to hold your applause. Kamal Hussein, if he could stand, and Akari Muna, if he could stand, because the two of them and I happen to be the former or present vice chairs of this organization that happen to be in the room. And No, no, hold your applause, hold your applause, hold your applause. But please keep standing, you've got to keep standing, we've got to get you working. And David Nussbaum is somewhere here. David, stand. And Kobus de Swat, where are you? You're standing right at the very back. These are two of the only four of the senior executives who've managed the organization over 20 years. But hold your applause, hold your applause. Because these gentlemen and our great leaders, they would never have accomplished anything if it hadn't been for all the people in this room from national chapters. Because without the people, we are nothing. So why don't they stand? Come on, all those from national chapters, all stand up. Now, wait a minute, hold your applause. Because none of you would do half what you do if it wasn't for the staff of the secretariat. So where are they? Come on, we need you up. Please stand. But now is my main point. None of us would be anything if we didn't get the support of the public at large. So if you're not standing already, please stand. <laughs> and please all give yourselves applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a tremendous privilege to open the, this part of the, the day's proceedings with a panel where we are challenged to talk about transparency. We are asked to talk about it in the context of business and investment and international trade, but we're going to expand the brief a bit because transparency doesn't stop at the border of the balance sheet. It goes wider. Uh, we have two remarkable, wonderful guests who've come, traveled here to Berlin to join us. Uh, Mr. Yves Leterme, is the Deputy Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. He has twice held the position of Prime Minister of Belgium. He was educated, I believe, at the universities of Louvain and Ghent. He is a former president of Flanders. He's held a range of key political offices in Belgium. And he plays a crucial role in an organization that I am very proud to say TI has been able to partner with for many, many years. That partnership has been crucial to help in the fight against corruption. Uh, with Mr. Leterme, we have Mr. Pascal Lamy. He, uh, he has played two crucial roles. First of all, he has really been one of those people who nobody here in the room really talked about but who was constantly whispering in Peter Eichen's ear and encouraging time and time again. And that's a special reason why we're so glad he is here. 
As many of you know, he has been the Director General of the World Trade Organization. He has been an official at the uh, European uh, Community Commission in Brussels. He has been the European Commission's Trade uh, Commissioner. He has been a banker, uh, which is interesting for all of us to note as well. And he left the WTO uh, at the very beginning of September, end of August, and he never stopped because he's chair of the Oxford Martin Commission, which just a couple of weeks ago, breathlessly, I don't know how you did this in, from between leaving the WTO and producing this document in a few weeks' time, talk, it talks about nothing less than the future generations. It is now for the long term. It is about governance. It's about youth. It's about cyberspace. It's about all these things. And somehow we're going to get into a bit of that as well. But first of all, I would like uh, Mr. Latern perhaps to make a few opening remarks. And then Mr. Lamy, we're going to be very short with our opening remarks because we want to engage you. We'll want your questions. We'll try and respond to tweets that we're getting here. Um, but first, Mr. Latern. Perhaps you can open up our discussion. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having us here and giving us the floor. They prepared uh, quite a long speech in Paris, but uh, in the uh, interest of time and uh, the, uh, the meeting, I, I will be quite brief. First of all, of course, uh, congratulate you and congratulate TI and the founders and uh, whoever made uh, possible this tremendous and successful journey during uh, 20 years. I remember when I came into the Belgian Parliament, it was in 1997, as a young member of Parliament, one of my first parliamentary questions I put forward was about the uh, taxation qualification, qualification for corporate taxes of, um, let's say, greasy money, money, uh, well, bribery uh, money. And I got an answer from the uh, uh, then acting Belgian Minister of Finance. This was 19. 97. Then it was, even in a developed economy uh, as the Belgian one, it was still considered as being something part of the normal business to use some money to influence procedures. So I think since then we have made uh, a long journey. We've had a lot of successes. Uh, there has been already made reference to the uh, so-called anti-bribery convention, which was signed in 1997. Um, the full reading louds, and I quote, OECD Convention on Combating Bribery on Foreign Public Officials in International Business Transactions. Um, we made a lot, we had a lot of success, but 50 years after, there are still some problems. And we're trying at OECD to work on it. We're trying to work on more um, uh, integrity. Uh, we work on engagement, more engagement by uh, governments, and of course we work on transparency. And let me give uh, three uh, to four examples per category of uh, what we are doing uh, for the moment. Uh, of course we are publishing a lot of reports, we are working together in uh, working parties with uh, uh, TI. A very important work we are doing is the so-called peer reviews. And what we see as, uh, maybe it could be part of the debate already, what do we see as one of the main problems today in the field of the uh, struggle against corruption is that, yes, there have been a lot of texts agreed upon. And the anti-bribery convention has been transposed in national legislation and in some countries, almost 15 countries, since uh, the start there have been concrete uh, results in terms of people sentenced, uh, people sent uh, even to, to jail. But what we lack is more, um, more um, stress on the enactment, on the concrete uh, implementation of laws, on the enforcement of laws. And I've been a prime minister of a country uh, which, is, uh, which has a developed economy, member of the European Union, neighbor state to, uh, to uh, Germany, and so on, and so on. And I can imagine that this is, like in other domains, really the main problem. You have very good texts. But in the tradition of your structures, your national structures uh, that are meant to, to fight all kinds of infringement to, uh, to law, you have a lack of, a of attention, you have a lack of skills, of knowledge and of priority given to this, uh, to this uh, problem. 
So this is already a very important point. In order to address this, we try to put it at the center of our peer review uh, systems. You know that OECD is, a, is a, an organization which works with member states that control each other, that exchange best practices, and we issue reports, country reports. Uh, we will issue also a global report next week, for instance, with a chapter on uh, corruption. And in this peer review system, of course, peer review can add some pressure to um, to make things possible in different uh, member states. In the field of integrity, uh, things we are working on for the moment is uh, uh, trying to uh, improve public procurement, uh, where there's still some room for improvement. It's very important in terms of um, economic value, almost 13 to 14 percent of GDP in our uh, member states is spent in uh, public procurement uh, works or works that are subject to public procurement. We're working on lobbying. lobbying. A new front we are opening uh, these days is the financing of politics. I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very fair to say that at this very moment, lots of our developed democracies are in crisis for different reasons. One of these reasons being the way uh, the political activity is financed. And of course, this uh, financing of political parties and political of people, of candidates and political action is still a source of risk for uh, corruption. And so we are trying to uh, do some good work and policy advice in the field of political uh, finance. On the other side of the, of the sphere, I would say integrity, engagement of governments, encouraging uh, governments to use all the tools to enhance transparency in, in their work. And there are lots of ICT tools, uh, more today than 15, 20 years ago, which are uh, at this very moment not used uh, enough to, um, to strengthen transparency in the daily uh, working of a, of a public authority. In terms of uh, transparency itself, I would give a, a, re a recent example of our work, which is quite spectacular. I think that we are very near to break truths in what we call the whole of the uh, BEPS dossier. BEPS is, uh, we, we like to work with acronyms, an international organization, and BEPS stands for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. And it's all about transparency there also. What is the point? The point is that based on our system of um, treaties that are meant to avoid double taxation, we are now in a situation of non-taxation where multinational enterprises have lots of possibilities to avoid whatever taxation. And this goes through a very uh, strange uh, and, and not so transparent uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, anyway, the result is that, for instance, for the moment, the Virgin Islands are one of the top four, top five investors in China. Uh, anyway, there is a problem. There is a problem of a lack of transparency, and this is an example of where we are fighting now to have more transparency. And under the leadership of the, the leaders in the G20, we have um, achieved to make some breakthroughs in that field. So as a matter of introduction for our panel discussion, of course, the most important is on behalf of the OECD, of all our colleagues in Paris, to uh, thank you very much for, the, for all the work, the magnificent work which is done. We would be nothing as an international organization, as the OECD, if there wouldn't be some pressure from the society, if we wouldn't have supporters, if we wouldn't have people to, to work uh, with in, the, uh, in real life, in, in society. And uh, Transparency International is a key partner for us in the work in the field of uh, governance and the field of uh, anti-corruption. Um, so thank you. And, and secondly, I wanted to point out a couple of dossiers where we are today working on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Uh, a moment ago, uh, Peter again uh, told us that one of the first steps of uh, TI uh, when uh, he was in uh, Kenya working with uh, Kitongo, the name uh, was a Business Practice Monitor. And I think it says a lot about this first panel, uh, because obviously uh, transparency and uh, bribery uh, are uh, very much connected with, uh, with trade, with markets, with exchange, with uh, investment, with where money circulates. And that's a reality of uh, today's uh, civilization, whether we like it or not, whether we find markets have, you know, too large 
uh, a, a force in our societies or whether we like it, the reality is that uh, this is a formidable occasion, uh, both for corruption and uh, for fighting against corruption. I think one of the great strength vision uh, of the uh, founding fathers of uh, TI 20 years ago was that corruption, bribery, transparency was f first and foremost a local issue. And it is first and foremost a local issue. It is uh, entrenched in, in local culture, in local habits, in local regulations or lack of regulation. Uh, this notion of islands of integrity, uh, I think, was the real recognition that it's first a local issue. You need local ownership. It can only work bottom up. And, and this concept of an island uh, is, uh, you know, clearly an island is not global, it's local. But, of course, once you've said that, uh, and it's probably even truer 20 years later with globalization, uh, having uh, such a huge uh, impact uh, on, our, on our lives, a series of issues which have to do with uh, fighting against uh, corruption and bribery, and I don't think the case need to be made here, it's just how we do it, is of a global nature. Again, not all, and probably not most, but some of that is of a global nature, Hence, the idea to leverage a number of global uh, governance uh, tools, whether it's classical rule-making, treaty, convention, uh, UN, uh, OECD, uh, WTO, and I'll just have a, say a word about WTO in a minute. That's the sort of classical old Westphalian way of uh, national sovereign uh, molecules uh, accepting some sort of uh, binding with each other, new ways of moving uh, this sort of issue forward, which we uh, explored uh, in this Oxford Martin School report, which uh, uh, was just uh, mentioned. And in this area, TI was a precursor with a TI index, which is a tool of governance. If you look not as much as the origin or the process of the tool, but at what the outcome is, TI index, like many other index today, have a higher impact on governments, businesses, citizens' reaction to corruption than a classical UN uh, or OECD or, uh, or WTO agreement. And I think that's something which we really need to have in mind uh, in order to keep moving forward. And then, of course, there are other streams like the one DI has, in my view, rightly so, and we're discussing this uh, this morning with uh, Daniel Lebeg, uh, Larson, and a few others, which is this G20 stream, uh, which I think is a great one, uh, not least because, contrary to the previous structure, which was the G8, the G20 is a much more balanced global forum. Uh, I remember I was a Sherpa uh, for the G8 during uh, many years. Uh, there was a problem with the G8 tackling uh, this corruption issue because it was always, you know, would always have liked, you know, these usual wasps uh, preaching the rest of the world about corruption. And that doesn't work. Uh, it never worked and I, I don't think it would work in, in the world of today. Now, just a short word before I conclude on what has been done and what could be done uh, in uh, the realm of world trade negotiations, whether they are multilateral, regional, uh, bilateral, and I'm not going to make you a longer lecture on this. You'll find the content of this in a chapter on trade and corruption of a book which I will publish uh, later this month uh, in the Cambridge University Press. Uh, the good news is that for the first time, uh, two years ago, uh, the world corruption appeared in a formal uh, WTO agreement, which is a specific agreement on government procurement. 
uh, which I think is a first uh, step, but probably uh, more could be done, either topic per topic, like customs procedure, for instance, and there is a big multilateral agreement cooking, hopefully to be concluded at the end of the year at this WTO Bali conference on what, we, what they call trade facilitation in the jargon, which is about customs procedure, which we know is a nest of, uh, of uh, bribery uh, occasions, or issues like the use of uh, non-tariff measures, like uh, precautionary measures, you know, sanitary, phytosanitary, and so on. So there's a whole bunch of possible piecemeal entries into these negotiations, and that could also be the case in big regional negotiations like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for instance, and some in the Trans-Pacific Partnership are trying to push this idea, or even more in the transatlantic uh, bilateral uh, negotiation which uh, has just uh, started, and there are a few ideas of where sort of an international, if not multilateral, at least bilateral benchmark could be created, which then would be pulling the uh, international uh, level. So there is probably more to be done in this uh, area, uh, including, including a concept which uh, we floated uh, for a few years now in you know, brainstorming with, uh, with Peter, uh, uh, with uh, Huguette and a few others, which would be, you know, why not a WTO full-size agreement on corruption? Uh, the advantage over the UN or the OECD uh, being that, of course, uh, WTO agreements have a, have a specific uh, biting comparative advantage because there is a dispute settlement which is compulsory, uh, which is not the case in any other of the international instruments. So that's, that's, that's what I think we could try and work in this direction. Uh, finally, uh, back to this big study commission, which I had the privilege to chair during one year with the support of this Oxford Martin School with, with people from all over the planet, uh, uh, all over the continent, disciplines. Uh, just to underline this, the validity, again, of this intuition, which a few of you, uh, including Peter Eigen, had 20 years ago, about what we call uh, creative coalitions, uh, what Peter called this morning uh, collective action. Now, if you look, and which we did during one year with this, uh, uh, with this big commission, we looked for the last 20 or 30 years at what worked and what did not work in addressing global issues. Uh, why did HIV AIDS work? Why does ocean depletion not work? Why did corruption move forward? And why did uh, nothing of a global uh, financial regulation uh, was done before the uh, 08 crisis? Uh, so we analytically, clinically, desiccated all these issues, and one of the big lessons of this sort of experimental approach, not something which is too top-down, is that there is a formidable potential in these collective action coalitions, and notably in a model which is TI model, which was TI model from the beginning at a time where this was not clear at all, whereas I think it's now much clearer, which is public authorities, civil society, business, working together. And I'm personally, for instance, convinced that this is the way on issues like climate change. Uh, if you remain stuck into the UNFCC, uh, UN 200 sovereign states trying to find a consensus, it will take years and years as it has. Uh, same can be said for some trade negotiations, but if there is a group of, let's say, 20 countries, 30 multinationals, 40 cities, uh, and important uh, civil society implication, I think you can get things done much quicker. It's not the aesthetics of the diplomats or of the lawyers very often, but sometimes it's much more efficient, and I think that's what we have to look at. Thank you. Um, 
Thank, thank you, both of you. I'm going to just put a, a, a few questions. We, we're getting questions on Twitter, and we have probably lots of thoughts that you have provoked here in the audience. Um, I'm an old school guy, and when it comes to corruption, I say follow the money. And I like to talk money. Uh, you've talked, uh, Mr. Leterme, about implementation, about enforcement. You've talked to, uh, about sort of these agreements and collective action. Let me pose something that's very much on the minds of many of our colleagues here. And I'm partly looking at Akeri Muna here in the second row because he leads the charge for TI on this. We've heard fine words, we've heard great pledges from all the great and the powerful and the big institutions about the repatriation of stolen assets. But Mr. Mubarak's funds and his family's funds are still well out of the hands of the Egyptian people. Mr. Ben Ami of Tunisia's funds are still in Swiss bank accounts and various other places and nowhere near Tunisia. The people of Nigeria have a right to have the money that was stolen from them by their leaders returned to them. How can we convince people that the rhetoric of the public announcements on something as concrete as that is really meaningful if we don't see the enforcement and the implementation and the cash flowing back? In other words, how can we move, and both of you have addressed this partly, how can we move to real implementation in ways that convinces the man in the street and the woman too? I don't know who would like to start. You? <laughs> I think, I, very, very simply, there are, there are two, two avenues. First one is let's try and build international disciplines that will constrain the behavior of nation states. Uh, the problem being that you can only constrain the behavior of nation states if nation states uh, accept to constrain their behavior, which is the whole problem uh, we've had about you know, building international rules. Then there is another road, and I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm French, uh, but which is using cleverly local legislations, regulations, which may not have been done with the purpose of catching, spotting, freezing, and leading to repatriation, but other legislations which you can use in the direction, which is what the French chapter has been doing uh, in recent years, uh, uh, because we all know that in Paris there are uh, a few uh, and around Paris, uh, there are a few properties or, uh, which come from this sort of money. Now, what, what they've done, and, and Daniel Lebeil, uh, who's here, who would probably uh, be more precise than, than, than I would be, what they've done is they've used normal local regulations to absorb this, and the case was made before the course, and it worked. Now, of course, uh, a number of people uh, are not very happy with that, and this has put uh, TI, uh, the, the national chapter of TI, uh, sometimes in, in the firing line of, let's say, part of the media. But oh, that's, that's, okay. a way, that's a way to do it. So again, I, my, my simple answer is a proper combination of global and local. Mr. Latev, just partly on that, because you talked about peer review. And in this particular case, my friends here would say, well, it's really London, and it's Switzerland, and it's New York, and it's, it's not... This is a problem that we're talking about very much in the money centers of the world. How do you... Where, where peer review, is that enough? I think peer review is already a, a very important tool, uh, but I have to admit that in... Uh, and you will refer to some cases that results, that concrete steps, that uh, concrete achievements sometimes uh, frustratingly lack. And so, um, but I think from your side, don't underestimate uh, your power to put more pressure, pressure coming from societies, pressure coming from uh, uh, NGOs. And so uh, at the end, you know, political leadership has to do what people are asking to do. 
And I think there's a growing awareness, uh, Mr. Lamy made re reference to what's happening in France, there's a growing awareness of what, uh, what kind of problem this is. The um, tools we are using until now are not efficient enough, the results are not there uh, in a sufficient way. So I think one very important way to, uh, to try to, uh, to push forward is to improve the uh, pressure coming from societies through, uh, through um, raising public awareness and the RTI has a role to play. Thank you. I, I think, you know, I raise this because it has very much to do with transparency in the financial system. We're talking here in part, as our program has suggested, about transparency in business. But you cannot divorce that from business's role, and not just business, in politics. And, and you partly mentioned that, and it's been alluded to earlier today. Never before have we seen so much money in campaigns and in political parties. Uh, I come from the United States where $8 billion was spent last year in the elections. $8 billion. As a result of that, the latest poll shows that public approval of the United States Congress has gone down to 5%. 5%. Uh, in the United States, according to business surveys, businessmen now overwhelmingly say we have a system in politics in the U.S. called pay to play. If you don't pay, you don't get political influence. And I would suggest that in many respects, the US is more transparent, more open than many other countries of the world. How do we secure the transparency that goes right to the heart of politics that involves all the kind of business that we're talking about and the institutions that you been associated with them, and please feel free to give a personal, not necessarily an OCD well, answer, but you've been in politics and, and you know this firsthand. Well, first of all, I think it's really a problem. There is really a problem. Uh, some, not, not the majority, but some of our democracies are in danger for the moment because of the, the, the role the money is playing in, in our democracies. And it's, uh, it's not only a question of transparency. It is uh, right and fair to say that as the US system, there's a lot of transparency. I think in my country we, we were successful in tackling the problem by a combination of measures, uh, putting limits to, um, to spending, um, interdiction for the use of some uh, tools in, in campaigning and so on. So you really can, uh, you can tackle the problem, but then you have, for instance, banned TV advertisement. We decided in my country not to have posters more than four square meters. Uh, in, 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 um, in size. We decided to ban TV advertisement. We limited uh, the total amount which is allowed to be spent. We limited uh, gifts and so on, so uh, gadgets. Isn't, isn't that an intervention in the freedom of speech and the right of the individual to express himself or herself as the US Supreme Court would Not say? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. You know, we, we had a lot of debates in the parliament, I remember, to, to elaborate on your point about uh, interdiction of gadgets uh, and, and the limit was that uh, when the message takes more uh, of the surface of a, of a substance than the substance itself, than the, the, I mean, the toy or the, uh, the pencil, then, then it's, a, it's a public message and then you cannot, ha you cannot say it's a, you're not allowed to, to distribute it. So it's really, it's possible to to have uh, full freedom of expression, full freedom of organizing political cam campaigns, put forward your, your messages in limiting the, the spending of money. It's, it's in some of our democracies, like you say, it's pay to play and this is not acceptable. This biases our, uh, our legislative uh, systems. Well, I think it's a, it's a perfect example of how difficult it is to globally converge on a single solution for that sort of problem. I personally am all in favor of a public financing of political parties. I fought with that when I changed politics. Uh, all public, with limitations of the kind uh, which uh, Yves Le Terme just uh, mentioned. Now, I know full well that the US Constitution uh, can be interpreted 
in a way, which the Supreme Court did, which is why the US political and electoral system uh, works the way it works, in saying, ah, 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 this is uh, communism. <laughs> which, which is basically what they, most, be, most people in, in the US believe. Look at what this debate about healthcare has shown. So if I'm whom sort of, let's say, moderate center-left, uh, I'm seen as a communist uh, by uh, a US judge. The only conclusion you can draw from that is that you know, you've got differences on this planet. Uh, uh, there are a few uh, ways of looking at things, and it will take time uh, before I convince a US judge that uh, the US Constitution should be interpreted the other way around. Okay, so I think it's a highly relevant issue uh, because Paying for politics, of course, entails a huge conflict of interest. And by the way, the US themselves have invented this sort of transparency prophylaxy, which is quite impressive. Uh, if you go on US electoral website, you will see who pays for plastic bags, uh, pigs, uh, SUVs, uh, uh, intellectual property protection for medicines. It's, transparency is a, is a good prophylaxy. But again, most of that, I think, has to be dealt uh, locally as a function of uh, local cultures, uh, local civilizations, while having the same purpose, which I think is what TI is about. Um, I'm going to just give one more general question, then open it up. And I'm moving on. We do not only have to look at the past and the present, we have to look ahead. And I'm inspired very much by the Oxford Martin Commission's report. Uh, I must say, as a communicator, I was somewhat overwhelmed by the huge titles, the future of youth, the future of politics, the future of almost the planet. So, coming down to ground, what do both of you feel should really be the two bold new ideas stimulated in part by your Oxford report, but also by other thoughts about that you could share with us today that can help to create a realistic vision of a new era of real transparency and accountability, be it in business or in government, be it for society or a whole, or for younger generations. What are the two bold ideas in this broad area of transparency looking ahead, maybe in the words of the title of your report, the long term. Um, I don't know who wants to start, but you see eager, so Mr. Letel, please. You know, it's, uh, it's an original or spectacular idea, but it's um, very clear that our basic economic concepts of the 70s, the 80s, uh, some consensus is also, uh, I won't elaborate on that, are really um, limited in terms of finding solutions for the challenges we are faced with. Um, we are working at the OECD on, on a project, uh, New Approaches to Economic Challenges, and uh, two, of, two or three of the main um, um, problems we want to, to face and find solutions for is to broaden the scope of the um, normally, normally functioning of economy towards uh, the social and environmental, let's say, the, the, the global sustainability uh, challenges. And so internalizing the costs of social cohesion, internalizing this, the cost of uh, environmental problems and the lack of the, the scarcity of uh, natural resources, I think is really key. We've seen that in a normally developing economy uh, with as uh, less rules as, as possible, um, these challenges are not, are not faced. And we think, we happen to think that in order to address this demand for sustainability, more social cohesion, there's a lack of, and, and more uh, environmental and natural resources responsibility, that their transparency can be of uh, enormous help. And besides that, then, we try to broaden the GDP as a, uh, as a measurement of, uh, of economic development. We have introduced, but that would lead us too far to elaborate on that, a better life index in which we have integrated things as uh, governance and, and, and even anti-corruption uh, and so on and so on. So I think a bold idea would be to, to find ways to have a level playing field and rules, regulations, that leads to an economic dynamics where 
the cost of social cohesion and environmental impact of our economic activity is uh, internalized and so that the uh, market economy can deliver results which are also socially spoken and environmentally spoken sustainable. I think uh, young generations are much more ready than our generations to look at demonopolizing international relations from the hands of uh, sovereign nation states. Uh, our generations, uh, we're all about international life, is about sovereigns entering into contracts, treaties, obligations, uh, or not. I think the world has changed, and I think TI, the very concept of TI is one of the ferments of that change, and that we need something where the monopoly of sovereignty is broken. Not that institutions do not matter, not that regulations do not matter, and they do, and I'm, I spent most of my professional life fighting against uh, nation states in order to establish some sort of European and then, uh, and then global disciplines, but this should not be the only road. There is in the mobilization of civil society, there is in the capacity of engagement of some business people, there is a, a, an availability of political energy that is absolutely necessary to overcome the classical pitfalls of the Westphalian sovereignty-based system, and I think the young generation is much more attuned to that, and that's that's where I mean I would I would certainly advise we should uh, we should keep digging. Thank you very much. We uh, for those in the room, you're probably not aware that we have lots of people watching this on the web, and therefore, in fairness to them, we should take a couple of their questions. Um, so, what are what are our invisible but nevertheless visible uh, participants saying? Maybe you could just give us two questions, questions straight away, and then we can try and answer. The, our panelists can answer those in one go. Go ahead, Natalie. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all the speakers. Um, one of the questions that we had, since the theme of this is trust in financial institutions. People were wondering whether banks will ever get back the trust of the citizens. So maybe. Okay, I'll give us the next question. The next question. Um, another question we received was, is money laundering something citizens should be concerned about? And if so, what can be done to combat this practice? Well, that's good because both of those questions sort of come together. One is what can banks do to revive trust? Uh, for the citizens, and the other is whether citizens should be concerned about money laundering and what to do about it. Uh, straightforward, simple questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Concerning banks, I think it's uh, stick to their, uh, to their basic uh, missions. I mean, we, we came into trouble uh, with our banking system partly because at a certain moment um, these banks were... Uh, trading products, nobody really understood what it was uh, all about. I remember uh, when I was a prime minister, I had to tackle, I think, the most important, the most dangerous impact of Lehman Brothers on the European continent with Dexia Fortis and so on. And then during that period, I had meetings with people that were part of the board of these banks. And they, that, that were quite important people. For instance, Mr. Varompe, who's, not, who's now president of the European uh, Union Council. He was a member of the board of Dexia, who was one of the banks affected, uh, acting prime minister, lots of important Belgian professors. And I asked them, well, how was it possible to invest so much in CDSs and so on? And they said, well, the figures were there, the, there was the, uh, the productivity of the product was there, we, we, had a, we had our earnings, our return on investment was okay, and so on, and so on. But it's fair to say that we really didn't understand what it, is, what, what it was all about. And so uh, I think banks will um, gain the confidence of the people again when they stick to their basic missions, which is collecting money 
and use it for uh, productive uh, activities that deliver a uh, reasonable uh, return on investment and redistribute his return on investment. Uh, what, what went wrong was that uh, due to a lack of rules, uh, a couple of decades, some of the banks went into businesses which were too much, uh, too risky, which were putting at risk in a too important way the, the money of the, uh, of the saviors and even of the shareholders. And so I think they have to uh, take distance of this and then it will be better again, you know. We, 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 we needed some rules, uh, even Bayern Munich cannot, uh, cannot play a good Champions League game without a referee, without rules. We have new rules now, but the behavior of the banks itself and more transparency about their behavior is key. Oh, I mean, I, I think it's a, th these two cases are very good examples of how a formidable crisis can generate political energy which wasn't there before. We all know that the financial crisis in 08, the main cause for that was a lack of proper financial global regulation of an industry who was the most globalized of all industries. And not that this wasn't tried. I mean, I was a Sherpa during 10 years for Jacques Delors and the G8. Many, many times this question came. But there was at least two of the big players of the G8 let's not give names this morning, who systematically opposed anything that would look like a proper step forward in global financial regulation on the ground that this would be counter uh, financial innovation. And this crisis has led to a new situation where I think there is some progress being made in the... Uh, in the Financial Stability Board, uh, which is uh, the real name of which should be uh, a world financial organization. Uh, and same for tax evasion and money laundering. If you look at debates in the G8, in the OECD, in the UN, in the ECOSOC, for years and years and years, there was a huge distance between what people like you and us were saying and the formidable resistance of uh, tax havens and sovereignty-based interests. Now, this crisis has reshuffled the cards. And some of the most stringent opponents of any international disciplines on this have now become strong advocates, which is great, which is great. And I think, you know, that's the way to go. Now, we shouldn't uh, wait for the next uh, apocalypse uh, to, uh, uh, <laughs> to create specific political energy. But these are situations which can be used and leveraged in this direction, in my view. Okay, let's, let's go right to the back. Is there any questions from the very back of the room? Because people back there always get overlooked. I think I see somebody waving madly from Morocco at the very back of the room. Maybe I'm wrong. My, my eyesight is fading. Why do, a question from the back of the room. Yes, sir. Is it? I will come to you. Uh, can we speak from Karl Marx Alley? I can't hear you. <laughs> can we speak from Karl Marx Alley? Please speak uh, directly from Karl Marx Alley. Thank you. Uh, cons concerning could you, banking, could you introduce yourself so yes, everybody? I am Thieu Incident from Morocco. Uh, speaking about banking, what I have learned uh, in school that uh, banks are producing money. They are the instrument we have to produce money. So they have a fantastic public power, a regal a regalian power to produce money. And in the same time, we have seen during the crisis that they are abusing this public power for private gain. Uh, the gentlemen we have in the panel, I think they can answer uh, if they have a solution, a regulation to obtain that the, the bank will not abuse their public power for private gain. What is a and that's the definition of corruption. 
abusing public power for private gain. Thank uh, you. Let me, let, me, let me try and be even more specific there. I think the concern that many people have is that people who run banks are taking or keen to take huge personal bonuses whilst not serving their customers. And as we've seen in cases in the United States very recently, some banks have actually cheated their customers whilst boosting the compensation of their employees. So I think that's partly to what my friend Sion has said. Um, and I don't know if either of you have some comments on this cultural issue about banks. Or bankers. You've been once. No, I, I was a banker in a former past of my life when being a banker was not such a terrible thing as today. <laughs> I, I don't think the problem is, is, is there. I think the problem is simply that if a bank goes bankrupt, it's a big problem uh, for the society. Mm -hmm. If my butcher goes bankrupt, no problem. Uh, if the garage uh, sale uh, next door goes bankrupt, no problem. If a bank goes bankrupt, it's a problem because many people who have put their money <laughs> in the bank uh, will be uh, stolen, which is why credit has, true, a specific public uh, uh, side, which is why, in my view, at least, these activities must be considered like other public goods, because there's a question of trust, and there's a question of, you know, the sort of too big to fail. This has to be properly regulated. And the sort of risk weighting, which is how much of equity you ask your shareholders to engage, and how much of that do you leverage for which sort of profit return, is the, is the right solution. And we all know that as a result of the crisis, the business model of the banking sector will have to move from a profit uh, expectation of a 15% return on equity, which was the standard, unsustainable standard of the last, let's say, 15 years that preceded the crisis, to something which is more like 5, 6, 7, 8%, which is why switching the system from 15% to 7, 8% is a complex transformation, including, including with important uh, uh, impact on employment in this, in this sector. Maybe you've got a brief comment, because we, uh, then we'll give you the next question. Very briefly, but I would like to, to broaden a little bit the perspective and not limit it to the problem of the bonuses in the banks. I think we really have some problems with the way our economy is functioning. Of course, we have short-term problems. We have to fix things to come to, uh, to, to regain a part of sustainable growth and, and to, let's say, we have to fix things in, in the short term. But we, we have problems with um, an economy that, for instance, even in, in periods of um, important economic growth, doesn't improve the uh, equality and equity. Uh, you know, social cohesion even in this country, here was under pressure during years and years where the economic growth was quite important. And so an economy that, even when it functions very well, doesn't deliver a fair distribution of wealth is, has, really has a problem. And so it's, it's broader than the problem of the bonuses of the, the people that are working uh, in, the, in the banks. And so these kinds of things, we should fix them too. A second aspect. Um, you can have uh, very good dynamics on the stock market for companies that are, uh, well, that are um, dismissing lots of people, hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, employment, we have a, a scandalous level of unemployment in lots of parts of the Eurozone and of Europe. And so this is not sustainable. And uh, as Mr. Lamy has said, at a certain moment, the the difference between what whoever felt as being the common sense and the actual practice in a sector like the banking sector was, was there. I think we now are confronted with something everybody knows is not sustainable. The functioning of our economy and the delivery or the lack of delivery in, ter in terms of employment, for instance, and the very high unemployment figures in parts of the Eurozone. And I think that could be one of the next sources of, of tensions uh, within, at least within the Eurozone and the European Union. And so we, we have to fix things in our economy 
uh, more than only the bonuses of some, of some bankers. We don't deliver enough social cohesion and social equity with our economy, and we don't, uh, inc we don't have enough jobs for the people, and lots of people, especially young people for the moment, in the Eurozone are really in trouble because they, this marvelous market economy doesn't deliver enough jobs for these people. Uh, we are almost out of time. I'm so sorry, but you're going to have lots of chances during the day. And I can take one more question, and I think it would be nice to take a question from the chair of our German chapter, who has played such a big role in hosting us here today. Um, if you don't have a microphone, there you are. Yes, my name is Edda Müller, and <laughs> TI Germany. Um, uh, for the time being, it's a question for Mr. Lamy. For the time being, the World Trade rules are the biggest barrier for transparency concerning the sustainability issues, uh, concerning products and the production phase, environmental, social quality of products, uh, where uh, the trade rules uh, do not uh, permit uh, governments uh, to decide on binding uh, information rules. So do you think, Mr. Lamy, that that can be changed in the near future? Well, uh, I think that's a fairly technical discussion. Uh, and I, I'm not sure I would agree with your starting point, which is that existing international trade rules prevent governments uh, from uh, uh, imposing, uh, for instance, uh, labeling requirements. On the contrary, on the contrary, there's nothing in WTO. Existing rules today, and again, I don't want the debate to become too technical, that prevents a government to obstruct trade on the ground of environmental or health protection. Nothing. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's an issue of just how to do it. And the general discipline is you can do that, again, on the grounds of precaution or protection of health, of environment, of a number of uh, sort of uh, social uh, collective preferences. Provided, of course, you don't do it in order to discriminate, which sometimes uh, is the way these measures are <coughs> implemented. Uh, but it's, uh, it's an important debate for the future because most of the questions of, of, of opening trade for the future will have to do with these uh, regulatory issues, with these uh, sort of standards harmonization issues, and not with classical old issues that had to do you know, with tariff uh, reductions. Thank you. I, um, I was asked by the organizers to try to summarize this discussion. I won't. <laughs> I, think, I think it's too difficult to summarize all of what was said. I think it's very important. I don't have a pin like Peter did to give away, but I have a bar of chocolate. So which says 20th anniversary fighting corruption. Um, before I let you go, and before I hand over, and before I ask you to applaud our colleagues, I would like just to make uh, one comment. I think we've learned from all of what we've heard this morning, including the wonderful speeches that started the day, about how absolutely vital our cause is. Today we celebrate 20 years of TI, which is just wonderful. It is a dream that I couldn't have dreamt 20 years ago. We also stand here today, here in Berlin, on the eve of another important anniversary, perhaps a more important one. On November the 9th and 10th, exactly 75 years ago, on what has been called the Night of Broken Glass, Kristallnacht, the great synagogue in Fazedenstrasse here in Berlin was destroyed, together with 266 other synagogues in Austria and Germany. 7,000 Jewish shops were ransacked. Thousands of Jews were arrested and deported. Some, like my parents, became refugees. And what we saw was the most vicious, most horrendous abuse of power, in, perhaps in the history 
of certainly of modern times. Why do I mention this? Because fundamentally the cause against corruption for all of us who started in this game and for all who have joined us is fundamentally about human rights, about the dignity of women and men. It is about trying to combat the abuse of power wherever it is. And I hope we can take from the memory of the 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht and we can be inspired by the 20th anniversary of TI to work even harder in our villages, in our cities, in our countries and together globally to continue to campaign against the abuse of power. And in that vein, I'd like to thank both of you for joining us and for your great insights today. And please give them some applause. Thank you.